All right. Um, okay, guys, this is Miranda Anderson, and I am so, so excited to introduce you to her. Um, she is from Live Free Creative Co., um, and you can find her on Instagram at Live Free Miranda. She also has a podcast that is phenomenal, um, and you guys need to listen to it. It's so good. Um, and really, I just, you're one of those amazing humans that I'm like so lucky that I crossed paths with you. Um, and I'm just really excited to have you here and to do this questionnaire interview, uh, conversation, whatever we want to call this. Um, but I'm excited to introduce you to all of my burn club plusers. Um, cause I just think you're, they're going to adore you. So thank you so I would, much. I would love for you first to kind of, um, well, actually first I want to tell people how we met, if that's okay. Great. Right? Yeah, um, and I don't even know if you know this, but I was in at Alt Summit two years ago. Okay. Um, I took your class on shibori dyeing, which was like at, so Alt, fun. Summit, at Alt Summit, they have these um, crafting classes to kind of give your brain a break and so that you can do fun things and interact with women in like a really fun sort of way instead of just all learning all the time. Yeah, totally. A really welcomed break and you were so phenomenal in that class and it was just so much fun and so I followed you and then throughout the year I'm following you and um, you just your name kept popping up in different ways I started listening to your podcast and I was like oh my goodness this is great and then um, I was on another Instagram page simply on purpose which for whoever is watching this if you don't know Ralphie and you're a parent um, check out Simply on Purpose. Great parenting tips. Amazing, amazing. But I saw that she did this course and your name was attached to it. And I'm like, this girl just keeps popping up. Like she just- <laughs> My fingers keeps, in all the little pots. <laughs> she just keeps popping up in the best sort of way. And then um, you wrote your book and I saw that your book came out. And then um, fast forward to the next Alt Summit and I'm still following you. And you decided to have a- book conversation at Alt Summit. And it was one of the best things at, that I got to do at Alt Summit this time so around. It was such great conversation with amazing women who all wrote books or in the book field in some way, shape or form. And it was just such a supportive, amazing group. And I went there because I wanted to like connect with you more because I just knew that we needed, I needed more from you. Like I knew that there was more in there that I could absorb somehow, some way, shape or form. And so I was like, oh, she does coaching. Like this is perfect. Like I just, I need to know more from this lady. So I, um, so I, I basically stalked you. Thank all you. The way. <laughs> So, so we're here. I got you in my tentacles and, and I pulled you in. <laughs> I mean, but what it is, Miranda, is like, you're just so authentic and like real with everything you do. And even when you're marketing, it never, like I tell people, you are like the most brilliant marketer because it never, ever, ever feels like marketing. And it's just like, I'm so glad that you feel like that. So it's just always like, you can tell that you genuinely want to help people and it, it just comes across in what you do. So um, anyways, I, I would love for you to talk about what you do a little bit because you do a lot um, in your realm, in your world. And I just would kind of love to hear you talk a little bit about it for everybody who's listening. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So I Live Free Creative Company is my small business that I run. Um, it has over the years had so many different iterations. I started as a blogger, like a hobby blogger back in 2007, which feels like the olden days of the internet. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, and, point, huh? <laughs> I know, right. We're like, what even was happening in yes. 2007? Like blog spot, that's what was happening. And like going down the side and checking in on all your friends. Um, and I have always been a doer. I've always been a crafter, a creator. I've um, worked with almost every medium. I mean, from stained glass classes to glass blowing classes to a little bit of wood burning. We talked about it the other yeah, day. Yeah. Um, I've done lots and lots of sewing. I've done dyeing. I've done painting. I've done just A to Z in the do it with your hands. You are world. like a Jill of all trades, right? The, and I just, yeah, I just grew Jill up that way. <laughs> yeah. I'm just an experimenter and I love 
the adventure of trying something new and, you know, seeing how it works. And sometimes I have great success. And a lot of times I have like what would be total messes and terrible failures, but I feel like the whole purpose is the process of learning and developing and growing. Um, in my business journey in the last several years has been all about helping other women create space for the things that matter most to them in their lives. Mm -hmm. So from the podcast, Live Free Creative is my weekly podcast that happens every Thursday morning at 6 a.m. Eastern. The show covers topics from how to make friends to how to make great decisions to money matters to um, balancing motherhood and business. I mean, we kind of cover the whole gamut but it all comes down to living a more creative, adventurous, and intentional lifestyle and helping people start to sort of peel away all of the shoulds and the, what the world tells you and what your family tells you and what your, your friends and what social media tells you is like the right way to do it, which for me kind of feels like this, like, yes, like a box. Someone's trying to put you in. Yes. Yes. And what I want to do is like tear down those walls and help you discover what matters to you and then make space for that and you know really pour your focus and your energy and your resources into the things that matter most to you yes. rather than having it spill out into all of these things that you think oh. are supposed to matter to you yes. but don't actually don't actually matter to yeah. me right 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 so mm-hmm. the the podcast i have the book which is really covers um the framework of the book was our family's journey to we spent an entire year not buying anything that was a a non-consumable good. So basically took a year off of any type of uh, consumer shopping. And And it's a fantastic read. You guys, you can read it in a couple of days. It is It's a short, quick read, easy, quick read, but there's just so many great pieces of information in it that you can take with you and kind of put in your life in a way that makes sense for you and your family. And it's, It just, there's a lot of great little snippets of little gems in there, right? Yes. Yes. And it's very much, very much was not written to convince people to become minimalist or to not buy things. It was written to help people see how by pressing pause and doing a little bit of evaluation, you can live the life that you want to live rather than the life that you happen to be living in the passenger seat because something else is driving. Well, and that's something that I really want to talk to you about is goal setting, because it seems like a lot of times people are just always trying to move forward, move forward and keep, keep pedaling, keep pedaling, keep pedaling. And they don't ever like pause. Like you need to do on occasion, take a step back, kind of look at the bigger picture and go, okay, what am I doing here? And that's something that I, I brought to you when I first came to you, I was like, let me show you my ideas. And I pulled out (laughs) <laughs> a all sized piece of paper with teeny tiny writing all over it that have all of my ideas and all of the things I want to do and all of the different places and all of these things that have been circling around in my head and put it onto this piece of paper. And then it was like, okay, well now I'm really overwhelmed, you know? And while it felt good to get it all out and to not have it all swirling in my head, I was like, okay, now what? And you said something to me, you were talking about this metaphor with a tree. And I would love for you to drop this metaphor onto my lovely people because (laughs) it is, um, it's one that I just think is so great. And the idea of like pruning trees and I just think it's so great. So please, yeah. Drop so this knowledge, my dear. Of course. <laughs> yes. This, I actually just recorded a couple episodes ago and a podcast episode all about this metaphor because I find myself coming back and back and back to it. The idea of the roots and the branches of our tree, the tree of our life. You can think of it as the tree of your business, whatever serves you in what area you're trying to work. Um, but I mean, it all ends up being this same big tree and you when you think about a tree, what we most often think about is the thickness of the trunk and how many branches it has and how far it extends and Mm -hmm. what color and types of leaves there are up there. And just this like magnificent display. Yes. Yes. It's all about what you see. It's all about the the showiness and the shade that it casts and this big magnificent tree. And what we forget is how that same thing is mirrored in the roots. If it's a strong tree. Yes. If it's not, you can have a showy giant massive tree and the first gust of wind will knock that sucker right over Mm -hmm. and it won't be standing anymore. Mm -hmm. Likewise, you can see a smaller, you know, a a more modest looking tree whose roots go so deep that a hurricane could pass through and it would remain standing. And between those two, 
I prefer the roots. I want my roots to be down deep. I want some depth in the things that matter to me. I want to understand my purpose and my why. And from that place, grow and decide what I need to do. And along with the pruning, we, I'm not a horticulturist (laughs) by any stretch of the imagination, but I do know. I mean, I've seen your garden. It's really beautiful. I have a beautiful yard. (laughs) Really beautiful garden. But I do know that pruning excessive branches enables more strength and growth in the parts of the trees that matter. So I have this little beautiful tree in my front yard. It's called a tulip magnolia tree. Mm -hmm. And during spring, the whole tree erupts in magenta flowers. It looks like two, like thousands sitting on the tree. I I mean, it's like the most amazing thing. I bought my house in October and it was, it was like a twig. I had no idea. And I was like, Oh, I had, I mean, it was like this magic that erupted in the spring. I didn't realize what a beautiful tree that I got. In the first year though, I asked a tree trimmer just because we had just bought the house. And I was like, there's kind of a lot of wonky things happening in the yard. Will you just come tell me what we need to do to get the trees all sort of up to speed? And happy. Yeah. You want them to be happy. Happy. I want them to be healthy. I want them to continue growing the right way. And this magnolia tree in the front, he said, I'm going to take all of the branches off up to about five feet. And the whole tree was maybe only 10 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And it was really bushy and beautiful. And he said, I'm just going to take all these bottom branches off. And I was like, yeah, yeah. what? The branches off the bottom of my beautiful gem tree yeah, that I just discovered? Those are good ideas and those are great things. I'm like, I like all of that, you know? Yeah. And he said, no, if we cut these off, you'll see that this tree will be able to grow. It will be twice as tall next year. It will, you know, it will have all of this ability. He's like, you're going to get back all of those branches multiple yeah. times over, but it's going to be growing in the right way and it's going to have more strength. And sure enough, he cut off what seemed like half of the branches and the ones that remained just flourish. Wow. And it reminded yeah. me that we can't do it all at the same time. And not every single branch of our life or our business serves us. The more we spread that out, the diminished our efforts are. And I really believe that people can do all of the things that they love. We just can't do them all at the same time. Mm-hmm. And we can't do them effectively at the same time. So I, I encourage people to dream big and to write all those goals down and to put all of, you know, all your wildest imaginings, put them down and then just slowly. Yeah. And then choose choose what you want to do now. I think I gave you the um, red, yellow, green light method of like, what are we going to work on right now? Yes. What are we going to be thinking about in the background and what are great ideas for the future that we don't even have to spend any time on right now because they're not happening soon. And that just helps to sort of distinguish where our time and energy and resources should go. Yeah. And it really just thinking about that metaphor, it pops in my head all the time now with business because it really, it works for life. It works for business. It works for trees. It works for all of us. Right. (laughs) And it's, um, it just, it pops in my head all the time because I need to make sure that I'm putting in the effort in the right places, you know, and it's easy with Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and email and so many things, Pinterest. And I mean, it is in so many different, your, your brain is in so many different places. And so it's hard to figure out where to put that energy. But I think hitting that pause button, stopping, reevaluating the whole situation, and then moving forward from there, like did wonders for me and I know it will do wonders for other people too. Um, so how do you, uh, go about choosing like what branches to keep, you know, like how do you go about choosing which goals to have or like, you know what I mean? Like how to set those goals? Like how do you go about choosing that? Is it based on what brings you joy, money? Like where does the importance lie? Or is that something that is just deeply personal for each person? Yeah. So I think it is deeply personal, but I think that the, the common thread from person to person is that those choices really are based on your own personal core values. Mm. And I really encourage people to do some work around what matters to me. What are, you know, where, from what place am I making my most empowered decisions? Mm -hmm. And, um, my core values are stated in every single one of my podcast episodes, because I talk about helping people live a creative, adventurous, and intentional lifestyle. 
creativity, adventure, and intention are three of my absolute core values. And so when I'm, and that's what you feel you guys, when you go to her Instagram page, when you go to her website, when you listen to her podcast, anything she does, those three things are so clear and so evident in everything she talks about, everything she presents, all of it. It's, that is, it's so evident. And that, that's, it's important to have, I think, a really solid foundation like that so that it kind of makes all of the decision making in the business a whole lot easier, right? Totally. It makes things, it gives me a lens through which to see the things that I want to do. So I may be approached by someone with an opportunity and I can filter it very easily through, does this further my purpose of, I mean, does it help me be more creative? Does it help other people be more creative? Does it feel intentional? Does it, um, you know, is it an adventure? Does it feel like not something I'm not, I'm not super into? Um, all of that kind of helps me determine whether or not it fits within my, my purpose. And there's a lot of opportunities that come my way that don't fit what I want to do, even great opportunities. And I'm like, you know what, that is so wonderful for someone else, but it's just not the right fit for me. And I think that you start to feel really empowered as a business owner and as a, as a human, when you're able to say, I love that, but it's not for me. I love that, but it's okay. I understand that more opportunities will come around that are aligned with who I am and what my business is trying to, to promote. Um, and the, it's okay to leave opportunities on the table that don't fit. And I, you know, as a young entrepreneur, like years and years and years ago, when I very first started to make money, I very first, so my very first like money making endeavor as an adult, after I, I actually am a nurse, I'm an RN and I haven't worked for years as a nurse. And it feels like almost this other life that I led. Um, yeah, it's just one of those other things that we have. Just another thing. (laughs) Um, it's so funny, but I, after I graduated from nursing school, I had a nursing job. I started a side hustle as an Etsy custom sewing shop. That's kind of where I started. I had been blogging already for several years, but this was the first time that I started making money um, Mm -hmm. outside of my full-time job as a nurse. It was kind of my hustle and my little bit of entrepreneurship that I started. And I remember that I was not discerning at all. I, there was a thing, it doesn't exist anymore, but there was this thing on Etsy called, um, what was it called? It was like treasure chest or something like treasury. I think it was called treasury where people No, this is old school Etsy. We're talking 2009. People could submit like, I need a princess dress for my daughter who's a size five. She wants it to be purple with sequins. And and you could go in and see all of these. It was basically like petitions and you could bid and send like a, this is what I, here's some samples of my work. Here's how much it would, I would charge. And it felt like, whoa, I could just start picking up extra jobs here. So I went in on the weekends and just started bidding on all of these random projects. And I made things from, and I started getting them because I was a good seamstress and I, you know, I had a good ballpark for my bids. And so I was making like satin ballet bags and like denim jumpsuits and hemming curtains and doing everything. And I mean, half of it, I was like, I don't even like this. Like I didn't, I wasn't like, it didn't feel like I was fulfilling my own design aesthetics or anything. It was just making money. Just like I felt, I felt so excited to be able to have found something, a little side gig that I could make money and have people just pay me to sew, which I love to sew. And I was like, great. But I learned really quickly, like half of those things, I, I am not interested in ever sewing again. Like, and so I started to kind of refine, what is it that I want that to look like? How do I want that to feel? And then you start to make your judgment based on how, I mean, does it bring you joy? Yeah. I almost, I, I almost do nothing these days that, that doesn't make me happy or bring me joy. Right. I know. I don't want to. Life's too short. I wonder if that's just like a product of being in your thirties or something. Is that like, that's what you discover in your thirties is like, I'm going to do the things that bring me joy. Make me happy. Yeah. But yeah, I, I feel you on that. Um, so one thing that, um, I feel like you do in, in everything that you do is problem solving when it comes to life, business, marketing, kind of everything you tend to find like really creative solutions for things. Um, like let's see here, your scheduling issues and you come up with like dinner plans so that you don't have to think so much during the week. Um, 
you get handed like, you know, oh, you're going to be teaching from home and you're like, that's okay. I'm going to just like rock homeschooling like a boss. And then I'm going to tell everybody else what I'm doing so that I can maybe help them too. And then you're like, um, you know, like you're just constantly, your, your podcast is all about problem solving. And, and I mean, there's so many things that like you've brought to the table. I mean, I've, I've picked up Spanish lessons and, um, ukulele because, ukulele of, lessons. because of, um, some things that you've mentioned on your podcast about free things that are happening. So like, it just, um, I, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've even decluttered my house because of you, like, le like so legit, glad. <laughs> legit decluttered my house. And it's addicting because every room I do and every little bit I do, I'm like, oh, I can, I can think more clearly. Like I feel better. Like everything. Focus. Yes. I, feels yes. So good. It all just feels so much better, but like, it just, um, it's just amazing to me how you find solutions to problems in creative solutions to problems. And like, do you, my question is, do you actively seek out the problems and find solutions to them? Or is it more like, the problems just present themselves and you're just a fixer and just have to fix the problems as soon as they pop up. Like, how, yeah. how do you go about, what's your process? Because okay. you definitely are like one of those people that are the most productive people that I know. Like it's kind of amazing how much you do in your, in the same 24 hours. Like you're like one of those Beyonce people where you're like, Beyonce has the same 24 hours. Like it, Miranda Anderson has the same 24 hours as the rest of us. So like, how, I guess, how do you? Yeah, do you <laughs> I, I, I love okay. this question. And I think that the very first thing that my mind goes to is that I am, I, I am an expert decision maker. Mm. I make decisions very quickly without a lot of humming and hawing about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I believe that decisions don't have one right answer. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the problem that, that people come up against, and this is like in almost any area of your life, you can come up against like uh, something that needs a solution. Yeah. And the real issue, the heart of the issue is that you just don't choose how to move forward. Yeah. That you stew about it and you consider all the possibilities and you go around and around and you ask seven different people and you get a bunch of different answers. And, you, oh, true. and yeah. what I do is I bump up against a problem and I decide what to do and I do it. And I think that part of that ability to decide quickly comes from making tons of decisions and feeling like um, I'm in practice of just knowing mm -hmm. that a lot of times you, you, you aren't going to have more information than what you have in the beginning. We, we like to trick ourselves into thinking, well, I just have to learn a little more. Or I need a little bit more time or I need to, you know, and I think a lot of times like you have all the information that is really relevant right from the get go and you can choose how to move forward. Um, a lot of people believe that there is one right choice. Like each time they come up against a decision, it's like, I want to do the right thing. And there's this perfectionism mindset. And I, I just was not born a perfectionist. So that's not something that I've had to struggle with. I'm okay saying, well, this is an okay choice. So we're going to go with that because at least that moves me forward into yeah. discovering what might be next. I also am under no illusion that any problem that I solve will be the end of the problems. I'm very clear that as I live my life every single day, there will be new problems. There will be yeah. new um, Never stop. issues, new <laughs> obstacles. And it really doesn't. And, and yeah. some people that might feel really overwhelming and unfortunate to some people, but for me, it feels like, great. That means I can just move past these ones today because there's going to be more. And I don't want to waste my energy being so bogged down by the little things happening here and there. Like I feel like bumps in the road are just part of the journey and the, the easier I make it on myself to move beyond them the more fun that I get to have and the more engaged I get to be in other ways. Um, well, I think it's easier for you too, to make those decisions because you've simplified your life down in so many ways, totally. mm -hmm. like with your dinner planning and with the way that your house is set up and with not buying things and with having like a set schedule of when you buy certain things or, you know, like it's, it's kind of all set up in a way where the decisions that you're having to make aren't so many every yeah. single day. 
it's not the same, okay, I'm going to need to make dinner tonight and I have all the options. What am I going to do? World. Yeah, no. You have a very specific, it's Monday. We know what we're having, you yeah. know? And yeah. And I that, very actively eliminate unnecessary decisions. There's a whole chapter in the book about that and a whole podcast episode about it. Eliminating unnecessary decisions, creating systems. I call them, yes. I call it automating life, automating yes. where yes. I make the decision ahead of time and then things just kind of roll. And I'm like, I, I know that I don't have to worry about it because I already planned on the time that I'm going to worry about it and it's not right now. So I don't have to think yes. about it right now. And um, that is all really helpful. Um, and I, I also think that a lot of times we just overcomplicate things. And um, I love something that Tim Ferriss says in his book, Four Hour Work Week. He says, I'm reading that one right now. Oh, it's so good. It is he so says, good. if this were easy, what would it look like? Hmm. And I'm like, that's such a good question. Like, if this problem that I'm dealing with were really easy to solve, how would that look? And so often, that is the solution yeah. that we have simply overlooked yeah. because we think that it's supposed to be hard. We think it's supposed to be complicated. And well, so we don't do it. We're trained and we're taught is that thing, you know, life is hard and stuff, yeah. you know, and get used to it. But I think if you can make your life easier, and you can make it so that you don't have to make so many decisions in the day, do it. Totally. <laughs> do it. Yeah. And we did that just recently with my family. I realized, I sat down and I was like, with one of my daughters, I'm like, how many times a day do you think you ask me if you can have a certain snack? And she's like, I don't know, like probably five times. And I'm like, okay, so let, I'm like, I'm like, let's probably, that's probably a minimum, you know? Yeah. You're like maybe 500, yeah. but I'll give you five. Okay, so let's say, okay. So each of you, there's three kids. So that's 15 times a day that I'm being asked if a child can have a snack. And when I get asked that, I have to stop whatever my, I'm doing, whatever I was thinking about, figure out what have they eaten today? Have they had something healthy? Is it almost dinner time? in that moment? 15 times a day. That's a lot of brain energy that I'm wasting. A lot of time. And, and so we came up with a much better system where my kids have certain snacks that they can have. They have a certain time frame that they can eat them. They can eat them first thing in the morning or in the afternoon. I don't care, but they have, they know what they can eat. And now I never get asked about snacks and it is brilliant. It's, it's heaven. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's what a simple solution like too. such yes. a simple solution. Yes. And it, and it, literally made it so I don't have to answer a question 15 times a day. Yeah. So and awesome. have whatever I was thinking yeah. about. Whatever I was and doing how, how cool for your kids too, to have the autonomy of like, yeah. Oh, I get to choose one. I don't have to ask mom every single thing. Like you're teaching them that they get to choose things for themselves as well. And so then that gives them responsibility. It gives them a sense of Yes. Uh, of pride yeah. and you exactly. know, like that's great. Well, and we're even, we even have it on a point system. They get, so they get six points a day and there's certain points for healthier items or whatever. Yeah. And so they get six points. So they're also having to do math, which is there fantastic. Yeah. So like it really has been such a game changer, but there's so many things that I've put into place because of you and the decluttering and just the idea of these autonomous systems and figuring out a way to make my household run a little more smoothly. And it's, it's changed. It's changed so many things. Like I feel so much more on top of everything because of stuff like that. So good. it's really good. Um, so, um, one thing that you were talking about in one of the last coaching calls that we were talking about was, um, when you're handed a problem, I just loved this, this, uh, mental image for me. You talked about how when you're handed a problem, you just are like, huh, here's a box that someone just handed me. I didn't want this box, but now we need to figure out what to do with this box, you know? And yeah. the way that you kind of worded it really makes it so that in the example of maybe someone criticizing you on Instagram or not being so kind or whatever it is, being able to kind of put it in a box like that yeah. kind of separates the emotion part from it. And like, it just, it really helped me. So I'm hoping it helps other people. Yeah. I would love to share that. that. Um, so this is specifically what we were just talking about were problems in your own life that you, yes. that you probably need to deal with because they affect you directly. Yeah. This scenario was talking about other people's problems that they try to give to you Yes. Or that they try to get your input on, or they think that they should relate to you. And you're like, 
And the thing is, a lot of us, because of social media, because of the way that we interact in online communities and forums in ways that we never did before, there isn't a whole lot of discussion around this. So we don't really yeah. know, like, what is the protocol for if someone calls me out online or if someone criticizes me or if someone says, hey, I don't like the way that you said that or did that? Like, what, what is the protocol for that? Yeah. And I think that the way that I like to think about that is that's someone else's problem. So they hand me their problem. Their problem in a box. Yeah. This is their problem. Yeah. And I get to choose then what I do with it. And I can, if I want, and I have the bandwidth and I'm invested in this relationship, I can open it up and examine it and go into it and pour resources into it and think about it and talk it out and moderate and mediate. And, and maybe sometimes that's appropriate. Maybe you do want to engage in those conversations sometimes. Most of the time I choose to see this box of someone else's problem and say, okay, and set it aside <laughs> and move on with my merry way. Like that is great that you think that it's wonderful yeah. that you feel that way. I am so happy for you to have your own opinions, your own ideas about the things that I'm doing. And I don't necessarily need to engage with them yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, if you feel sometimes like those problems, I mean, they, they can be so emotionally draining. I just had a phone call with my sister last night who called me because a neighbor came over to tell her she just, just hasn't even moved into this house yet. She's redo, remodeling a house right now. And she was over there working on something and a neighbor knocked on the door and she opened the door and the neighbor told her about something that she had been doing wrong in the yard. Oh my goodness. <laughs> she, hasn't, she hasn't even lived there yet. And this neighbor felt like she should tell her that she didn't really, she didn't really agree with the way that they were managing some of the landscaping. And so my sister, bless her heart, called me so upset. Like she felt like this, you know, like this woman didn't even welcome her to the neighborhood. She just started telling her what she was wrong with the land. She's like, I don't, I don't even live here yet. I don't even know. And you know, she said that they had, the woman had said that someone else had been talking about it. So like other neighbors oh, were involved. Yeah. And You're like, so then she's like moving to a new neighborhood and already feeling right? like the neighbors hate you. That's right. So terrible. she starts to, yeah. and I, I, I said, you know what? I, I know where your mind's going and what you're starting to do, like what this just invites you open this box and what it invites is you creating an entire story about all yeah. of the conversations that other people are having about you. But none of that is true. Yeah. None of that is real. It is all invented. You just tuck all that back up, close the box and say, this woman is more than welcome to her opinions yeah. about my yard. And it has nothing to do with me. Yes. It has nothing yes. to do with me. And, and that can be really hard and move on to mentally do, but I yeah. love this idea of the box because for me, metaphors really work. The and visualization is so helpful, yeah, right? I think a lot of us creatives, it does work for us, the visual. Yeah. And so it gives you that visual of, nope, this is going right in the box and I'm going to put it over here and I'm not going to let it out and let it affect me. You know, yeah. and that's a really important thing to hold on to. Right. Um, so another thing that I face with business and life, let's be real, um, is staying organized. Um, and you seem to be pretty darn good at this. So, um, except for the calls that I've missed with you. Oh, we, I mean, and like, I wasn't late today. It's totally, fun. um, we all, so, we all get a couple uh, yes, freebies, okay. right? Yes, totally. <laughs> we are human, you know, totally. Um, but, um, so staying organized can be really difficult. Is there like, do you have certain apps? Do you have certain programs? Are there certain things that you would recommend to the people who are listening right now or watching um, that might help their creative business to just be a little more organized? Like, is there, is there any tips or pieces of advice or apps or anything like that that you want to let the people know about? <laughs> so I wish that I was, technologically savvy and advanced enough to say I have all of the right apps for you. I am a paper person. And so mm -hmm. I do most of my organization in my planner. My this look, at that, look at that big planner. My paper brain. And, but I do recommend, um, I do recommend planning 
Yes. I think that as creatives, oftentimes we just sort of like follow our whims and we like keep it all in our head, all the things that we need to do. Yes. And then we don't quite get to all of them or we get distracted. We're like working on one and then someone reminds us of something and then we start working on something else and we never finish this one. And yes. like, I know that because I do it. Yes. And, um, and so I think all of us right now. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a few things that I set up for myself. So one of my favorite things is to choose three things every day that are my headliner goals for the day. This is and such a good thing to do. It's yeah, such a good thing to do. Start the day with these are the, if I accomplish these things, nothing else matters. I can do nothing. I can sit on my hammock and read for the rest of the day for all that anyone cares, you know? Yeah. Um, and making sure that I have those planned out. And I like to think about them maybe even the night before, like what am I going to do for the week? Actually, one of the things that I do in my planner, I want to find a good example of it, is I know if you're a list maker, you probably like to, um, so here's an example. You won't be able to see completely, but I like to divide my list into home and to work. This little sticker says work. So I'll write my to-do list over here of my home to-dos and my work to-dos but I don't leave them on my to-do list. I don't feel like they on my list mean anything. They start to mean something when I plug them into an actual day that I am going to accomplish those yeah. things. Yeah. And I am a block scheduler. I'm a block planner. I have a long podcast episode with a huge free workbook all about that, like how I map my, my time. Um, but I know when my work hours are in the day and I know when my home hours are in the day just because of the way that I've scheduled. So if I say I'm going to record this podcast episode during my work hours, I know when that is. Yes. Yeah. Because I've already, I already know when my work hours are. Yeah. Um, so I think that the list making is great, but I don't ever try to actually work through my list this way. I use my list as a reference point for actually creating appointments with myself. And I like to think of them like that. I'm creating appointments yeah. with myself that if someone were to say, Hey, do you want to go do this? Then I, I say, actually, I can't. Yeah. I have plans. I'm busy until three. Could yeah. we do it at three fifteen? Um, because I want to keep the same amount of commitment to myself and my business as I do to other people and their businesses. Um, Which is hard to do. It is really hard, hard to do, hard of, you know, giving yourself the oxygen first things, but it's, yeah. In and I, I like to do the same thing with my self-care habits as well. Set appointments for myself that I take myself to lunch at least once a week. And it's looked a little bit different with COVID because I mm -hmm. used to walk down to my favorite cafe that's a few blocks away and sit on the patio and eat and have my dog with me and read while I ate lunch with myself while my kids were at school. Well, guess what? The world that's is different. <laughs> yeah. um, but now I, I'm, I'm like, lucky. But that sounds just that sound amazing. Like just... Dreamy. I could really go for 2022. I'm going to be back to that habit. Um, in the meantime, I make sure that I have at least one day scheduled that I can get takeout at my office. I, I don't have a home office. I chose when we moved to Richmond to lease an office outside of the home, which also creates some separation of work and, mm -hmm. and motherhood for me. Um, right. but <laughs> Even at home, I think it's helpful to have a space that's sort of dedicated, whether it's just a corner or just like a window seat or a table or something that you feel like you can take yourself apart for work. And, um, and even when I'm not working, like this lunch date is like, I need to have some time that's just me and some delicious food that I did not make or shop for at the grocery store that I can just take a beat and just like that I can use for evaluation. I can use for planning. I can use it for listening to an audio book but I try to give myself time for me that builds me up, that builds my energy, that, that renews my reserves because I know from personal experience and I really believe it deeply that if I am a vessel that is not full, that I cannot share. But if, if I, as I fill myself up, I will overflow into my business, into my family, into my community, and I'll be able to share and show up in the way that I want to. Yeah. I need to take I mean, the only way to do that. I really need to take your advice more on this front, on the self-care front. That's for sure. I, especially, I, I had a good handle on it before COVID and yeah. then COVID hit and just my exercise went wrench. out the door. My, how I ate went out, like just so many things 
yeah. kind of went out the door and I went into survival mode, which is fine. What we all have done. Survive that. But yeah. now that this is the new normal, now I really need to get that part mm-hmm. back in, back in and working better for yeah. me. Yeah. I, one of my favorite ways to think about this just really briefly before we move on is understanding myself as a whole person. I, I like, I don't love to multitask. So I really like to be mom when I'm mom. I like to be like focused at work when I'm working. I like to sort be of fill. Is it yeah, intentionality? I like to be intentional. I like to fill yeah. my roles very separately. But sometimes when we do that, when we start to peel off um, our roles into and put them in their own sort of sectors, we forget how when I am performing well and inspired at work, that that's the same person that, yes, who's filled up with creativity mom, yeah. and inspiration. When yeah. I go home and I become mom, it's still yeah. me yes. who f- feels all of the energy and all of the inspiration from the work projects that I was doing. Yeah. And when I have a wonderful present moment with my kids and we're running through the sprinklers or we're, we're on a bike ride together, I take that same energy and all of that same wonder into my business. As I take care of myself in each of my different aspects, they feed into, I'm a better employee, self-employee Yes. when I'm a better mom. I'm a better mom when I'm a better friend to myself and I give myself the time and space that I need. I'm a better wife when I'm a good mom. I'm a better, I mean, it's all the same thing. It all just supports itself. It all supports itself. And sometimes people say, well, I feel guilty taking time for myself because then I'm taking away from my kids. And I'm like, no, no, no. You are giving to your kids when you take time for yourself and you become a more empowered, a more um, inspired woman you show up better for your kids. You're, that's a benefit to them. So I think that it's helpful to just remember how we're whole people. Yeah, I completely agree. And I am, I am going to be asking for time for myself very soon. So yay. Yay. (laughs) yay Something to look forward to. Yes. Um, so I was talking about earlier how you are, um, just a natural marketer. Um, you, it never feels like selling and I've been sold to by you many times, <laughs> clearly. Um, and, but, I, but, I don't, but I don't feel like I was sold to because yeah. one, what you provide far exceeds any expectations I have. I think that's one I'm of so them. glad. Um, but I think part of it is also you, you just really, really believe in what you're selling. And I think that that's also a big part of it. But I would love for you to kind of talk about I mean, that's from my perspective based on what I see from you. Um, And I mean, I love marketing. I think it's so much fun. I think it's one of the best parts of having a business is kind of figuring out your audience and what they need from you and what, you know, what they want and how you can help them and serve them and all of that stuff. But I just want to hear kind of from your perspective, marketing in general and kind of how you approach it. Yeah. So the way that I like to think about marketing um, has two facets. One of them is the story and one of them is the results Mm. or the promise, the outcome. I don't, I I try to not think of any of the products that I sell as being valuable in and of themselves. Their only value is the process through which the recipient changes, becomes Mm. better, becomes more empowered, becomes more clear on their goals and their, and their dreams and their vision. Yeah. So um, I try not to sell my five-week program. I try to sell uh, the idea that you emerge from this program with more purpose and passion and clarity than you have had in years. That you come through, it's called Live Free From Clutter, you come through Live Free From Clutter and on the other side, you have reduced stress. You actually have more money and more time than you did before because of the things that we learn in the program. And I can, I can talk about it that way because that is the outcome because I have used it myself because I have now had hundreds of people go through it and I can say, this is what happens. These are the results. And so rather than saying, well, it's, I mean, I do in very small, like people want to know what it entails, but more than that, they want to know why it matters to them, mm-hmm. how it's going to change their lives. And I think that that's the same for 
a physical product as it is for the types of things that I sell that are coaching and, you know, um, e-courses and things like that related. Um, I mean, when you think about the reason that you buy a physical product, it's because of the way you think that product is going to make you feel. Yes. Yep. You never, I never buy something because of what it is itself. I buy it because of how it's going to improve my life. Mm-hmm. because it's going to live. I, I love a fat straw. I love like that. I am being sustainable because you know, that it keeps my drink really, really cold and I can be in the hot, the hot sun all day and still have my cold beverage. And I see myself as this sustainable, environmentally friendly, outdoorsy person. And this supports my vision of myself, you know, um, there's yeah. a million stainless steel cups that you can buy. Yes but this is the one that made me feel the way that I want to feel. Yes. Um, so I think when you think about your product, a lot of people sell their product and like the specs and the, this is what you're getting. When I think that the more natural marketing is why the story, you would, why you would it, even you know, want it, why they would yeah. want it. Yeah. Well, and part of that is in my world is I think, um, people want to invest in people to a certain extent. They want to, they fall in love with the artist and the person that they're following and they want to show support of that artist, you know, um, more than that piece of art necessarily being the be all end all. It it's really about supporting that person and and owning a piece of them on your wall, you know? Totally. And that's so so much of the story the the like, um, bringing yourself the, into the story, bringing yourself you know? into yeah. it, having people follow that journey. I think the people who buy handmade art feel really good about that part of themselves. Yes. yes. That they, they very much are a person who could have bought something at Target, but instead they invested in a handmade piece yes. by someone that they love. Um, and that is a part of them. That's a piece yeah. of them. And they, yeah love to feel that personal connection that's involved. Yeah, so playing so, on that, I mean, making sure that like there is the personal connection. Cause if you're a hand ma- if you are hand making things, people want to be buying something handmade. They don't want it to feel corporate. To they don't want it to feel they want to know the story behind disconnected. It. Yeah, yeah. They want to feel like, Oh yeah, they're investing in a person in an artist. Completely agree. And I think that that's um, a really useful thing for everybody listening to, to take with them as far as how they present their pieces and, you know, the ideas behind it and the process behind it and all of that stuff that brings your audience in, in such a beautiful way. Uh, yeah. Speaking of bringing your audience in, I would love to talk about like growing and engaging growing an engaging audience, like an audience that really is involved. Um, because I mean, your community is fantastic and strong. I mean, mine is too. Yeah. Go burn club. Yes. Um, but I'm just like, I'm wondering how you do that. You know, how, how do you go about doing that? There was something that you said, um, and it was, I think an Alison Faulkner quote, um, what's her Instagram handle? Remind me again. Um, the Allison show with one L. Yes. Um, and she, you said that she said something along the lines of invest in people who invest in you. And so like, is that, is that your approach when it comes to your people is like, cause I mean, that's how it feels from being a follower of yours is that I always feel like you truly care about all of your followers taking these little tidbits and using them so that they can live a better, happier, more intentional, creative life. Like you really, really care about that. And it feels like you invest in your listeners. You invest in the people that are following you, the people that read your blogs, like you invest in them. So is that, I mean, is that how you did it? Is that how you created this engaging group of people? Is by making them feel invested in? Yeah. I mean, I think that it started, I think a, a community always starts with, um, with the openness to share a bit mm-hmm. of yourself to a bit of your heart. I, I mean, authentic is such a buzzword and it almost like pains me to say that word no, because I'm like, Oh but, yeah, I know. But at you the know, same time, it is but the ability to just be really real with people about what matters to you, about what's happening for you, about how you share your, your process. I think one thing that I do that my audience has always, um, 
has always really resonated with is that I walk through the behind the scenes of what's happening in my life and my business. So all the adventures um, you go on, you're like, I'm going to build a shed. Watch me do it. I'm going to, I mean, I don't really know. But we're just going to go. Here we, we go. You know? I mean, I like to show, I love to teach. So I like to show the DIY. I like to show the behind the scenes when I do sponsored posts. I mean, um, which I, I mean, for years and years, my whole revenue of my business was built on, a, on a blog sponsorships. I, I've been a sponsored blogger for years and there is so much sort of mystery surrounding that. And I sort of pulled back the curtain and was like, this is how this works. And, um, when I, started a sponsorship. Of course, there's all of these really clear guidelines as to what happens when the sponsored post goes live, but I would start my audience with the, you guys, I'm so excited. I just got a sponsorship with Home Depot. This is what it's going to look like. And then when the products came in the mail, it was like, yay, my package came. And they're like all so excited for me. So, yeah. and I'm showing the behind the scenes and I'm showing what we're working on. And, and then when the post is done and goes live, it's people, not just an ad. They no, it's not just an ad. They're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I, I always think what, I mean, for every post that I put up ever, I ask myself, how does this benefit the people who are receiving it? Mm. How, what is the value that, that I'm giving so to my audience in this post? And if I can't answer that question, then I, I probably shouldn't post whatever it is. If it doesn't uplift, inspire, I mean, the things that uh, I choose to do yeah. are to, yeah, uplift, inspire, give a little nugget of information, maybe a little bit of laugh. Like if those are the things that I like to do. And if it falls outside of that, if it's more of like self aggrandizing or a little pat on the back, I'm like, that's the thing that I text to my sister and I say, yay me, you know, but if it's a, uh, you know, a fun project that I've walked people through or a tip or a question, I'd love to, it, it also sounds very trite because in the day and age of social media, you can find, I mean, a million results on Google of how to build an engaged audience. And one of the things people will say is ask them questions, like actually engage them. Yes. And I think you can do that in a way where you're like, I want an engaged post. And so you throw a question out or you can do it in a way that you really actually engaging. want. You're yes. actually interested. Yes. Um, I think stories is very valuable when it comes to building engagement because it is so much less like curated than the static feed. Well, and I was telling my people just the other day that, you know, stories, you watch a certain, you know, 10 people or however many people that you follow. And there's some stories that like you feel attached to and like you want to watch those ones every time they pop up because they're always interesting, you know, and yeah. you're one of them for me. Design mom is one of them for me. Yeah, who, yeah, me. Yeah. I mean, her stories are always just so you always walk away with knowledge. You always you learn something, the process is interesting, the whole, the whole bit. Right. And uh -huh. I think that's what makes those stories so great is that it's, you're getting to go along this journey with you, but then you're also like learning something in the process, you yeah. know? The other thing about this that I think is really, really important for people to know and something that I am working on continuously is understanding that I can be myself and give as much of myself as I can and share the things that feel near and dear to my heart that feel like they will be of value. And there will be many, many people who do not find value in what I share. Yeah. There will be lots of people who will click over and maybe follow for a while, or maybe my stories come up and they're like, I don't really get her or she's not really for me, or I don't really care about what's going on for her. And so they unfollow me or they don't follow in the first place. And I'm so happy because I want people not only to follow me, yeah. I want people who want, who are engaged and who are interested and who do want to follow along with that, what's happening. And I also never, ever want to be a person that, that other people are following that's making them annoyed or feel bad or, or, um, yeah. you know, some of those negative emotions that can come from social media. I always tell people, be vigilant about cleaning out your own social media yeah. feeds. Only follow people who uplift and inspire you. There's no that's reason so that you good. have to... Yes fill your, I mean, you get to choose what you consume. So Even make sure you that you guys unfollow me. If it, if I, yes. you see my posts and they make you upset, just unfollow me. It's Move okay. on. And you can do that for a time and come back, you know? Yeah, and, exactly. and I mean, I also think that if you're feeling down in general, social media is not really the place to go to be uplifted. Like I think that actually stepping back into your real life and becoming present and, you know, grounding yourself in reality, that that is a really helpful way to sort of start to feel better. Like I, I know we use social media as kind of a crutch when we're feeling low and that's probably one of the worst things we can do. Um, but I, 
I think that it becomes so much more fun to engage on social media when you're so happy and focused on the people who are there yes. rather than constantly wishing there were more. Yes. Rather than thinking, gosh, if I could only get to 10,000 followers or if I could only have more people watching my stories or if I could have more, you know, well, if you focus you on what's them, there, you love it. Come. Focus on them and serve. Yeah. Yeah. And then the people will come and they'll be the right people. They'll be the people yes. that you want to be there because they're going to be the people that want to be there, you know? Totally. Yeah. And, and I also, I love telling business owners, small business owners that, um, I mean, you can, you can have a million dollar business with 100 Instagram followers and you can have a million Instagram followers and not be making a single dollar. It's so so true. when I'm thinking of my business growth, I'm very rarely thinking specifically of my social media growth. In this day and age, a lot of people correlate those two. Like if my business is growing, that means my social media should look this certain way. And that's not true. You can be running a, a massively financially successful yes. business yes. with a very small following. Yes. And um, that's also very empowering. Yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. Um, so another thing that um, I struggle with, and I know I'm not the alone in this is um, other people's perceptions of me. And this I think goes along with kind of the box idea um, and things like that. But I know that like, <laughs> like just the feelings of being not liked can be overwhelming for people. And I know that they can be overwhelming for me. And I know that Instagram can be a hard place for things like that. Um, with likes or, you know, having a negative review or something along those lines. Do you have any um, pieces of advice for people in how they can deal with a nasty comment or a bad review? You know, um, because I think this is something that you're, you're really good at is navigating these problems, right? These problem areas, these, you're a problem solver. And so when someone is confronted with a problem, like what, how do you go about solving that in a way where you walk away with your head held high? You know, because yeah. I think right now, especially like with online stuff, if there's copying or something, I think a lot of people go into attack mode and it gets nasty and cancel culture and all of that stuff. And I just, I think the way that you talk about how to deal with these sorts of negative things is, um, really helpful and something that I think people could benefit from. So, yeah. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind, there's a, the, the, I'm going to probably talk about three things. One of yeah. them is abundance mindset. Yes. As we develop an abundance mindset that says there is room enough for everyone. Yes. And there is plenty of work for everyone and there is plenty is of money for everyone. Over competition. Community over competition. Yes. As and this is something that actually needs to be practiced. It needs to be developed. It needs to be worked on. It needs yes, to be practiced when again. When you have those feelings of competition pop up, which they will pop up, that's the moment where you need to lean into the community more. That's when the moment where you need to lean into you know, the togetherness instead of feeling those feelings of competition and not enough space for all of us. Those, yeah. those feelings. So. Yeah. So there, there's some actual like practices actually in live free from clutter. One of the modules is all about developing an abundance mindset and some actual practices that you can go into. I also have a podcast episode about this. I don't know which episode you can just scroll through <laughs> the archives and find it. But, um, there are some, I mean, there are ways on a regular basis you can be practicing abundance yeah. mindset. And I think that is really helpful because when someone either starts to tear you down or say that they don't like the way that you did something. If you already feel pretty good about what you are, how you're showing up, what you're putting into the world, um, then it's easier to say, that's okay for you to feel yeah. like that. Um, I mean, in, as, in terms of copycatting, that's something that I just, one of the other things I talk a lot about is energy management. And I just feel like that's such a leaky bucket. Like, trying to manage other people, you know, like it's just really hard to hear, but it's true that there are no unique ideas. Like you have been inspired by other people. They will be inspired by you. There are accounts of, of copyright infringement and plagiarism. Oh, yeah. My husband is a patent okay. attorney. Like 
we, yeah. there are some really specific guidelines, but most copycatting that exists is not, does not fall within an illegal practice. Yeah. And it's okay to be upset about it. And it's also okay to not be upset about it. It's also okay to say, it's okay. Like, I'm, I'm going to keep doing my thing. I'm going to keep moving in my lane. No one else can take away the ideas and the inspiration and the creativity that exists in my head. So I'm going to just forge forward in my own lane. So that's the first thing, abundance mindset. The second thing is um, a tip that I, I think is from Brene Brown. I've read all of her books, so I'm not sure which one it's from. One of but them. <laughs> one of them, it's either her or Elizabeth Gilbert two goddesses in my mind of creativity and vulnerability. And, but um, the idea of having pre-chosen your people, the people whose opinions matter to you. Mm. And she recommends, I'm thinking now that it's Elizabeth Gilbert, probably from um, her book on creativity, Big Magic. Okay. If you haven't read Elizabeth Gilbert, Big Magic, yeah, it's I highly recommend it. Um, she says to choose your three people she recommends three, whose opinions matter to you. I'm like, this wasn't Glennon Doyle? I don't I, think so. She, I'm like, I swear she has She may have gotten it from too. one of these other ones. Yeah, but, she does pull from Brené Brown a lot, and, yeah. and she quotes her and talks about her all the time. They're I mean, we all should be all the, the time. The abundance thing is that they're not enemies. They support each other and lift right. each, lift each and other up. Talk each, about each other. The, the benefit of knowing who your people are is that then you can be really clear about everyone else's opinions maybe not mattering as much. Um, so a really beautiful thought and a really like nice way to move past some of the, you know, yeah. comments or negative I mean, or whatever it is. Choose that like mine or my husband and one of my sisters and a really good podcast um, blogger friend that if I'm okay, like if I bounce this, like, someone said this about this. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And they're all like, you're good girl. We love that. Then I'm like, yeah, that's how I felt too. Okay. There are times when we're in the wrong. There are times when something oh, yeah. is off the mark. I actually did a podcast episode um, several weeks ago now before all of the social justice movement about a criminology theory that I didn't understand had a lot of racial undertones. Mm. And I, the day it went live, I had someone comment um, really kindly in my direct messages and just said, Hey, um, I just want, I didn't know if you knew the history of this theory that it has some, like it, it, it really has some racial undertones. And, and I was like, Oh yeah, I didn't know that. But it also, I kind of skimmed over it. I was like, Oh, but it also really serves the metaphor that I'm using it for. And so I kind of moved on from it. And then when with George, the murder of George Floyd and all of the black lives matter movement. And I, am, I, I care deeply about that. So I've been moving through it. I had another person say, hey, because I, I shared a lot about Black Lives Matter and about things we were doing as a family and how we were kind of moving forward in, in the fight against racism. And I had someone else say, hey, I love all of the things you're sharing. And it seems a little weird to me that you recorded this episode about this very racist policy. And mm. I didn't record, the episode had nothing to do with the actual application of the criminology theory. It was just a metaphor. And I had just heard about it in a book and I didn't do all of the proper backstory research, I guess. I just didn't think about it. So, but because I had now two people who had said, Hey, maybe you need a heads up about this. Then I was like, okay, honey, what do you think about this? You know, I, I kind of checked in and was like, actually, I, I didn't buy yeah. this in a racist way, but I want to be really clear with my audience that I do understand that this was problematic. So I went back and re-recorded the whole intro for the episode and said, thank you so much for letting me know that these, that the, you know, the way that this was used was really problematic. And I in no way endorsed this. And I think that it was wrong. And this is what a good example of all of the different policies that we've sort of glossed over for years that actually had such a negative impact. And so I was able to address it and apologize for it and reach back out to those people and say, thank you so much for yeah. letting me know, rather than just thinking, because in some ways, when you really are in the wrong without meaning to be like we make mistakes and so when you yes, when you are in the wrong yes and someone calls you out our first natural response is usually to be defensive and when you remain open to like maybe i did make a mistake and sometimes when i check in and people are like no i think you're fine then i'm like okay i feel okay about that but when i check in and people are like mm, i don't know 
know, maybe you should look at it again. Then it's easier to say, okay, let me look at it. And, but either way, remaining open in the beginning to like, not jumping straight to like, no, I'm right, you're wrong, but like, yeah. okay, let me explore. And that's where you get the box and you're like, okay, let me, yeah, maybe I see. Need what do I think about this, value. you know? Yeah. Um, it happened with a fundraiser we were doing for the Amazon, um, us woodburning artists, and I first used the hashtag burners help the Amazon. Oh, <laughs> which what? And the Amazon was on fire, and it was just not the right hashtag. Not the right time. <laughs> yeah, and and so and it was fully to try and benefit the Amazon and to you know rebuild and to raise money for it, but it was just like. Oh, I missed the mark here. Ooh, I still now. missed yeah. the mark here, you know? Totally. Yeah. That, that can happen, you know? And I changed the hashtag and we changed course and it was fine. Totally. And we all pretended yeah. like it didn't happen and it was great. Totally. You know? But yeah, uh, the, yeah, the last thing is. Yeah. Totally. I think the last point that I want to make in this respect is that um, I like to sometimes choose to think of the online criticism that I get as an example or sort of a manifestation of my success. Because mm. if you are not doing anything that disrupts anything, if no one cares about what you're creating, if no one has any opinions about it, then maybe you haven't pushed the needle far enough. Mm. And when you take a stand, I think of Hamilton and like Aaron Burr, if you don't stand yeah. for something, like yeah, what, you, you know, for nothing, then what do you, what stand do you for? fall for? Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Sorry, when you I'm misquoting Hamilton. I know everyone knows the the lyrics. Um, I I think that when you actually start to, the more clear you get about what you want to represent and how you want to represent it, the more opposition you'll naturally have because not everyone thinks the same way and not everyone thinks the same things are valuable. Not everyone likes the same style, yes. and this goes back to invest in people who invest in you. The more clear you are the more clear that line is that someone will recognize themselves as wanting to be part of what you're creating or very clearly recognize themselves as not interested in what you have to offer. Yes. I think that is a great distinction. I want people to either completely identify with me or say, oh no, she's not really for me. And, and that's fine. And that's okay. Yeah. Um, my favorite example of this is when I published my book about I don't know, a month after it was published, I got my first email from someone who totally disagreed with <sighs> things that I talked about in the book. And it was, a, it was a guy and he actually hadn't read the book and he was making all of these assumptions based on the Amazon description. And he had looked at my Instagram and just, basically he was telling me that I wasn't enough of a minimalist to have written a minimalist book. Okay. He's like, I looked at your Instagram. Like, it looks like you have a lot of clothes. Like yes. <laughs> it was so, it was so great because I was so confident. No, I don't think I was overly confident, but I was very confident in the work I had put forth and the reason that I did it and the purpose behind it and yes. the audience it's intended for. Yes. This email slides into my inbox from this online troll. And I'm like, oh yeah, my first my first rejection email from a troll online that I don't even know. And I like called my husband. I was like, you will never guess. I'm a legitimate author because I'm getting hate mail from people who don't even know me. And I took it as like a badge of, of honor. honor. Yeah. That's like so I am, honor. I've made it. Such a good because way. People to who don't even know me are taking time out of their schedules yeah. to write me an email. Yeah. Like, well, and, and there's some things that you can't even control. I mean, these are things that you can't control, right? Yeah. And like, for instance, my book is up on Goodreads right now and people are reviewing. There's already 20 reviews on Goodreads and they're amazing. Not even available yet. Like, yeah. they're, they're so good. But it's so funny because you'll get one and this person, I've managed to convince them to buy a wood burning tool. They're so excited to get started. It seems so great. They love the writing. It all makes sense. It's clearly laid out, blah, 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 blah. Three stars. And you're like, wait, what? You know, and like, there's You're nothing a little stingy with your star ratings. There's just nothing that you can do about that, you know, and right. I can sit here and be so upset about it. Or I can just be like, you know what, I made something that I'm really proud of. And like, they, I got them to get a burner. So like, I'm doing Breaking something up. right, totally. you know? Yeah. Uh, but this, it's also, I mean, I've run into this too in the wood burning world. There are some people that don't believe that if you use transfer tools and trans, you know, transferring a design, 
that that's art. They don't believe that that is art, that it, it all needs to be hand drawn. And that what I teach and the way that I teach is encouraging copying, which I don't agree with because I believe wholeheartedly that wood burning is so important and art is so important for your mental health, for your well-being, for, for everything. And I want more people creating art. And if I can take the barrier away from them of the fear of failure and give them permission to create, then I'm going to do that at every step of the way. And that's what my book is completely about is giving people permission to try to like actually make these things and make them successfully, you know? And I think what I make is art and my sister came and she made a design and, and, you know, traced a design and burned it and then add watercolor to it and was so proud and felt like she made art because to me that's art, but my definition of art and other people's definitions of art are different. And so, and that's okay. You know, it's, yeah. it's totally okay. I'm not for everybody and I'm realizing that and that's okay, you know, but, yeah. but I am like the, the thing that you were talking about with serving the people who like want to be served, like helping the people who want to be there and having the people there that, that want to be there for you and what you're putting out into the world. I mean, that's what Burn Club Plus is. And that's yeah. why like, I'm so happy to have this group of people that all have the same sort of mentality about what art is, what community means, and coming together to you know, create this space that is just so beneficial for everybody that's in it. So totally. it's, um, and you helped me to, to realize that in our coaching sessions. I mean, I, you know, when we first started coaching, I wasn't so sure like how much it would help or what I would, you know, get out of it. And like you, like I've coached other people in the past and I'm coaching people now and I believe in it, but like, I think everyone who coaches needs to have a coach too. Yeah. I, think, oh, I mean, you very much. Yeah. hundred yes, percent. And really what it comes down to is it's the talking to someone else one-on-one -on -one about your stuff it's like a therapy, but for totally. business this is really yeah. what it is. Yeah. It's, it's therapy, but for business. And, um, it just, it, having someone to bounce the ideas off of is so wonderful. And I just am such a massive believer in it. And I just, you've, you've been like my, um, little secret weapon, you know what I mean? And now, <laughs> now everybody knows about you. So, um, I love it. Um, any other advice that you want to, before we, I let you go and let you get on with your evening, um, any other advice that you have for a small art business? Um, I think that like back to my, my core message really for myself all the time, as well as for other people is, um, I think that we are most empowered when we recognize that where we are today is where we're supposed to be. Mm. that what you're doing right now in your business, even if it feels like it's not very much or you wish you were so much further ahead or you can see how life will be better when you get to that distant mm. point, that you recognize that where you are right now is exactly the right place for you, that it is from this moment that all of the future happens and that you're doing enough right now, that you don't yeah. need to run any faster, you don't need to be any smarter, you don't need to have any more money. Like there, everything that you need in order to get to the next step of your life is available to you right now. And that just agree, like just deciding to believe that about yourself, that I have everything that I need to take the next right step in my life and in my business enables you to then have the confidence to start to move forward yeah. in the way that you want to. I, just I think it's put that on my wall and have it in front of my face all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, something like that, a, you know, a reminder all the time of like, you're, you're doing exactly enough. You're exactly where you need to be you're more than enough, which is the you're name more than enough guys. So go and check her out, please. Miranda, 
so much for doing this with me. I so appreciate it. I loved it. It's always a wonderful time to talk to you. It's so much fun. I, we could do this all day. Um, totally. You guys follow her at Live Free Miranda. Check out her podcast. Uh, it's so good. Everything you do is so good. And Thank I just, you. you're a gem and I appreciate you for doing this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Burn Welcome. Club Plus. I'm so um, glad that you're all here. Well, We've been so excited for I you want, to all be gathered in. I want all of them to know too that Miranda's the one that came up with the plus. That was all her. So I came to her with the idea and I, I want to do Patreon and I'm, you know, this, that, and the other. I'm like, but I just don't know what to call it. Like I'm having such a hard time. And she came up, she was like, how about plus? And I was like, done. Like, that's so easy. That's so perfect. So <laughs> we can thank Miranda for our little plus. You're very welcome. Her. I think it's so cute on the little logo too. The that's little burn really club plus. Good. I it's love really it. It's easy and simple and clean. It's it's perfect. So yeah. anyways, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. much. Have a and wonderful I one. I will talk to you soon at our next okay. meeting. <laughs> Sounds good. See you later. Bye. Bye.